All right, well, hello everyone and happy Patient Safety Awareness Week. Um, thank you for joining today's webinar called Be Safe in the Hospital, Learn How. My name is Sarah Miller and I'm our Director of Partnerships here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation and I'm really excited to moderate today's webinar. Next slide, please. So before we go through the agenda, I just wanted to um, go through a couple logistical things. Um, all of you attendees are muted upon entry and will remain muted with your video off throughout this presentation. If at any point you have any questions that you'd like to send through to our speaker today, there is a Q&A section at the bottom of the Zoom if you hover over um, the little sidebar. So please submit your questions through there and feel free to utilize the chat to speak with any attendees regarding some of the topics that we discussed today. Um, so going through the agenda, we'll be talking about a little background about the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, who we are, your safety in the hospital, um, some of our free resources that we provide, um, COVID-19 resources that we provide, and then finally, the last 15 minutes of today's presentation will be utilized for a question and answer session between myself and our speaker. So excited to announce that our speaker today is our very own Ariana Longley, our Chief Operating Officer. So with that, I'd love to pass it over to Ariana to give some background about herself. Thanks, Sarah, appreciate it. Um, and welcome to everyone. Thanks for joining and happy Patient Safety Awareness Week. Um, I'm the Chief Operating Officer here. I've been at the Patient Safety Movement for Foundation for about six years and I have a background in public health, but I do want to give a, a big disclaimer that I am not a doctor. I'm not a clinician. I'm not a health worker. So I'm presenting this to you today as kind of a fellow um, patient, a future patient, um, and we've gathered a lot of information for you about how to be safe in the hospital. So just keep that in mind for the questions and answers. If your questions do get clinical, I'm happy to um, go ahead and pass those on to some members of our team and, and circle back with you. So um, let's get started. So some of you may know who we are and some of you may be new to the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Um, the first thing that I love starting off with with any presentation is an example of a patient um, story. And so um, I do want to warn you if uh, you're squeamish, this video that I'm about to play does contain some graphic images and it may be upsetting to some people. So um, if that seems like something that may affect you, you may want to check back in about four minutes um, and perhaps uh, uh, come back, go get a, a cup of coffee or something and come back. Um, but with that said, I'm going to play a short video and then uh, we'll get into more about who we are as the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Just as the nurse was about to put down the white padding that was over my incision, my mother said, wait a minute, there's something on her stomach. Looked like a mole. And my mother asked the nurse to call the doctor to come back, and uh, she didn't want to. She said, I am not going to call the doctor for what's going to turn out to be nothing. My mother said, I'll call the doctor. I'll never forget, I was looking at my doctor, and I raised the gauze, and I just saw his face completely change. And when I looked down at my abdomen, the black dot was gone and there was a quarter size pustule. The infection kept spreading and it was starting to go down my leg. Over two million patients a year get hospital acquired infections. I ended up having six more surgeries, nine blood transfusions, I left the hospital with an open abdomen that took three years to close. My hospital, they were cited for being in violation of five state laws and 10 federal laws for unsanitary conditions in their operating rooms. It took me 10 years of almost weekly physical therapy to get back to a new normal life. I spent this past year, 2017, fighting for my life all over again. I went to the hospital with a sinus infection and they said, okay, we're going to keep you because it looks like you're starting to be in the early stages of sepsis. Well, the next morning, the infectious disease doctor came and he said, oh, great news. We're gonna send you home. And I said, really? And he said, you know my history. I said, I'm a survivor of sepsis, pseudomonas, MRSA, VRE, and necrotizing fasciitis. 
can we wait until my labs come back before you discharge me? And, you know, I'd like to see what some of the cultures are saying. And he goes, oh, we didn't, we didn't do any cultures. We don't need that. And, you know, we did a test for pneumonia and influenza, and you're fine. You don't have those. So we're going to go ahead and let you go home. And I said, well, can I get a second opinion on that? Can we talk to someone about that? And he said, I'm the best infectious disease doctor in the valley, probably the state. Any other doctor is going to tell you the same thing I'm telling you. I ended up having two more surgeries, two more blood transfusions, deep vein thrombosis, blood clots in both arms. I was right back where I was five years before. And it just, it really cemented for me the need to change the way we teach doctors, the way we treat doctors, the way they interact with patients and patients interact with them. We need to start sharing patient experience with our medical students, with our nursing students, so that they can get it from the horse's mouth. When you're building your, your house, your profession, you want to make sure that you build it on a solid foundation of patient safety. It's a major reason why we've seen 50,000 fewer preventable patient deaths in hospitals. And if you want to know what that means, ask uh, Alicia Cole, who suffers the long-term effects of a hospital-acquired infection. You know, we've learned a lot in healthcare, and we're better than we were 10 years ago. We're doing great at talking about patient-centered care. We're doing great at talking about preventing errors. We've got to do better in the action of it. So I don't know who else I'd rather have start off a presentation um, like this than Alicia Cole. Uh, she remains on our board to this day. And you know, for those of you who don't know us, she's the reason, all of the patients are the reason that we're doing what we're doing, um, why we set our vision and our mission to really bold and audacious goals. So with that said, um, our vision um, is changing as we head into this kind of new decade and we're in 2021 now, we've revised our vision and our mission. Um, so even those of you who may be aware of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, this should be new to you. So our vision is to achieve zero preventable patient harm and death in healthcare by 2030. Um, for those of you who um, have been following us, you know that we've been really focused on hospitals the last eight years, but we're starting to really embrace patient harm and um, obviously the most severe form of harm, which ends up in death all across the healthcare system, um, across the continuum of care. And uh, it wouldn't be us, it wouldn't be the Patient Safety Movement Foundation if we didn't set the bold and audacious goal of trying to do this by 2030. We, we need to urgent, ur, excuse me, urgently get to this goal of zero um, and therefore we will do our very best to get there by 2030. <clears throat> Our mission is to urgently unify people and collectively improve patient safety across the globe. Uh, we do a, a great job, I think, of bringing people together um, so that we can work on solutions together. And so our, our priorities as an organization, we have three. One is forging global relationships and partnerships and collaboratives to actively promote change for patient safety. The second is to de develop and disseminate patient safety education to governing bodies, healthcare professionals, students, patients, families, and the public. So this is part of one of our priorities today is educating the public, educating you all about how you can stay safe in the hospital. And third is to create public demand for safe and highly reliable care. We want all of this knowledge to bubble up and impact you know, policies here in the United States as well as abroad. So that's just a little bit about who we are at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Um, we're gonna now move into the second part of our agenda, which is your safety in the hospital. So let's first start with some facts. Um, we, pub we did a public poll of the American public last year, um, right about this time um, in April, uh, <clears throat> when everyone was in lockdown. And so 
we asked people a series of questions and, and one of the most important questions that we asked that has impacted our organization is have you heard or read any news reports about the number of medical errors and patient injuries last year in your state or your community hospitals. And 70% said, no, I haven't heard or read any reports on medical error in my state or local community. And that 21% said, yes, I've, I've heard just a little. So if you're talking about like, yeah, maybe I've heard something about it, that's 91% of people in the American public that don't know about medical error and, and likely don't know how to be, <clears throat> excuse me, be safe in the hospital. So we have a lot of work to do and we'll be repeating this survey every year going forward. So <clears throat> with that said, um, if you don't know, medical errors are the third leading cause of death in the United States on a normal year. Um, I, I don't want to overlook the fact that we're still in the, the COVID-19 pandemic and, and you know, nearly 500,000 people have died at this point alone in our country. So for this year, for sure, um, COVID has become the third leading cause of death. But remember, medical errors happen year after year after year after year. So these are just a few um, of the kind of headlines from major news outlets uh, showing that this um, research was done back in 2016, saying that about 250,000 people die in the US alone from medical errors. Um, I also want to just throw out some news articles that, um, that you might see from all across the world. So this says baby died in dad's arms after bungling hospital medics made five major mistakes. Um, shrouded in secrecy, grandmother dies. Um, we have medical errors end with teens thumb replaced with toe, you know, horrifying <laughs> incidents um, happening all over the world. So uh, just a few examples of, um, of all of the errors and, and how they impact and, and make it into the news to let people know about it. Um, and, and lastly, just to really connect this back to COVID-19, you know, this article that was published in August of 2020 uh, shows, you know, as COVID-19 spread, the feds relaxed rules and hospitals tried to contain the outbreak. Other infections may have risen. So this is something that we've been talking about a lot. You know, COVID-19 um, took a lot of resources and, and had uh, administrators and, and health workers focusing on the pandemic. And so in, in some cases, other infections may have uh, been on the rise. And, and also, this is an article out of um, the BMC, um, International Journal for Equity and Health. And, you know, the safety of healthcare for ethnic minority patients is pretty appalling. Um, so this, this article states that patients from minority groups are at higher risk of patient safety events, which are events that could have or did result in harm to the patient compared to the mainstream population. And we've seen this as it relates to COVID around access of care pretty much in general, but um, we know that minority groups may be at higher risk of patient safety events. And this is important to consider when seeking care. So <clears throat> let's continue into how you can prepare for a hospital visit. So the first thing is do some research. One is research your medical issues. If you have a sore throat, do some research on that. If you you know, have some chest pain, do some research on that, search the web. You know, um, I think that some health workers out there are going to say, oh gosh, you know, searching the web and you're going to find all these things and all these zebras when it's really just horse uh, hooves that are, you know, hitting the ground. Um, but it can be a really good source of information for you to, to at least say, you know, hey, I saw this. Um, is, is this what we might be looking at? if you're unsure about what's going on with you. The second is to research your doctor, your who you're gonna be seeing. Um, one example of this, and we're not sponsored by them, is healthgrades.com. If you go onto their website, you can type in your um, you know, practitioner's information and you'll get information about them. Sometimes it'll tell you their credentials, um, you know, where they went to school. It, it sometimes gives you ratings um, from their patients. And this can be a really good way if you're you know, have to go to a new doctor and a new type of specialist to just give them a, a, a checkout. Um, it's, you know, a little bit more specialized than a Yelp or a, a Yellow Pages. And third would be do, doing research on your hospital. If you're, you're planning on going in for um, an elective surgery, there are two great resources. One would be the CMS or Medicare website. They have a tool called Hospital Compare, and you can type in uh, your zip code and it will tell you all of the hospitals around you and what their, um, you know, what their safety ratings are. Uh, Leapfrog Group 
is a group that takes a lot of that hospital compared data and then also supplements their score with a survey that they send out to those hospitals. And so their data is <clears throat> a bit more patient safety centric. Again, they're a great nonprofit um, that, that puts together and compiles this data on, uh, I believe, a quarterly basis. So if you aren't aware of those, just next time you consider going in to see a specialist, you have to go in for an elective visit. Um, these are some great resources for you. Um, the second is to kind of know your possible risks and alternatives to proposed treatment. So um, I have three kind of basics here. So if you're going in for surgery, um, as an example, you know, what kind of complications might you expect? You know, is it as simple as there might be bleeding at the site of the surgery? And what does that mean? When do you need to escalate that and, uh, and call your, your doctor to say, you know, hey, this bleeding has been going on for too long? Is it something like nausea? What kind of complications might you expect? That's a really great question to ask. Um, it's not a stupid question to ask, depending on uh, what you're going in for and what kind of treatment you're seeking. There's all sorts of different complications that you may want to be aware of and know, okay, this, this might be normal and this is definitely not normal. Um, second is, what else should you be concerned about? Kind of uh, on the same lines as the last, you know, is it blood clots, um, pulmonary embolism, delirium, uh, based on medications that you might be given during anesthesia or shortly after in the post-operative period? What should you be concerned about? And again, fair question for you to ask um, your, your care providers. And third is alternatives to proposed treatment. So maybe they say that you should go in and, and get surgery. Is that the only option? You should always be able to ask and feel comfortable asking what your alternatives might be. Is there something else that you can try? Um, for example, maybe it's a diet change. Maybe it's being more active. Maybe it's just trying a medication or doing physical therapy um, versus rushing off into surgery. Um, and again, if, if surgery is the best option, then you know um, consider that. And, and also, if you don't think that that is the best option for you, then always consider a second opinion. You, you always have the, um, the right to go and get a second opinion. So what should you bring with you? If you're going into the hospital, the first thing would be your medical records. Um, and so your medical records has a whole bunch of different components. And so I'm gonna highlight a few of the important pieces that you can have control over as a patient or as a family member who might be supporting someone who's going into the hospital. So first is your problem list. Um, and, and this comes from our very own Steve Barker <clears throat> and his checklist. So what is your chief complaint? You know, what is the purpose of you being in the hospital? Um, you know, did you cut off a finger? Is that the reason? You know, why are you in the hospital? It, it sounds um, basic, but just, you know, state what your chief complaint is. The second is what other medical problems, treatments, conditions, comorbidities do you have? Did you cut off your finger, but you're also diabetic? Are you anemic? Do you have COPD? Do you have allergies? What other types of treatments um, have you had or problems do you have that may impact that chief complaint? Because yes, you might cut off your finger, but if you also have a clotting condition, they probably should know about that clotting condition because you're now bleeding from your finger. Um, making it really basic here, right? Um, second is your medication list. So the name of your medications, the dose that, uh, that you take, and the frequency. And the best case scenario is if you take multiple medications, throw them in a baggie and bring them all with you. Actually bringing your medications with you can be really, really helpful to those people who are caring for you. They can also, depending on how many medications that you have, they may also notice that you might not be needing to take one or you might be taking a medication that is treating two conditions. Maybe you got a prescription from a doctor that you went to two years ago for your diabetes and then last year you went to a new doctor and they gave you a very similar medication. You may be kind of um, double dosing on on what that um, would be treating. So uh, problem list, medication list, and if possible, if you have control over it, maybe if you don't cut off your finger and have to go to the, the ED really fast, if you can plan for it, bring your medications with you. So this is just a um, slide from the World Health Organization. Um, this is the five moments for medication safety. And so this is where you as a patient or a family member can step in and um, ask questions. So um, this, this starts with starting a medication. When you're starting a medication, some of the questions you can ask is, what's the name of this medication and what is it for? Um, what are the risks and possible side effects of starting that medication? Second is taking the medication. So it's really important that you ask or, or understand 
when should you take this medication and how much should you take at that time? And then what should you do if you have side effects, if you are nauseous or feeling dizzy or whatever it might be, what should you do if you have those side effects? Third would be adding a medication. So let's say you have to add another medication. You know, that, that gets back to what I said in a, a few slides ago. Do I really need any other medication? What is this for? Get back to kind of the basics. And uh, very importantly, can this medication interact with any of my other medications? So uh, again, if you're going to multiple doctors, um, best case scenario, they're all, they're all talking to one another, but realistically, they probably aren't. So um, it's important to, to make sure that you, as the person who's taking that medication, uh, know that if there's any other medications that you're taking um, that might interact with them, uh, that you can avoid uh, that situation. Fourth is reviewing your medication. So how long should you take each medication? You know, maybe they give you a, a month's worth. Should you continue taking it? Are you gonna get a refill? Um, and then uh, the second question is, uh, am I taking any medications I no longer need? So for this, for the same reason, when you go in and, and check up with your doctor, it's a great time to say, look, these are what I'm taking. Do I still need to be taking all of these? And then lastly, stopping medication. When should you stop each medication? Um, I think that's uh, fairly basic there. And if I have to stop my medication due to unwanted effects, uh, where should I report this? So if you end up saying, you know, 15 days into your 30 day um, prescription, you know, I, I have to stop this. I, I, I can't take the nausea. How do you communicate that back to your doctor? So um, second, uh, as we move past kind of medications is as far as your medical records go, you, you should have this information or be able to recall if you've had previous surgeries or other related treatments. And this gets back to what I said before, if we're going along with the example of you know, cutting off your finger, um, what other previous surgeries or other related treatments might affect that chief complaint of you going into the hospital that day? Um, what was done? How did it go? Did you have any complications? Remember, if you had a complication once, is it likely to happen again? It's important for you to bring up those, um, those things. And lastly, if you were under anesthesia, how did you tolerate it? Did you get delirium after? Were you extremely um, uh, uh, nauseous afterwards? Um, you know, how did you tolerate it? Because again, if they're going to give you the same anesthesia as before, the same medications, um, they may be able to tailor it or change it if you didn't have a great reaction. So all of this can really affect your experience um, when you're in the hospital. All right, so bringing an advocate. So this is my favorite slide. So if you are uh, only gonna listen to one thing that I have to say, I'd, uh, I'd like you to listen here. So one is to always assume that the best information about you will come from you. So you know yourself, you know what's, what's normal, what's not normal. Um, the best case scenario is that you will be able to advocate for yourself. But if that's not the case, then an advocate is a great way to, to have someone who can be there along your side. If you're unconscious, if you're gonna be in surgery, they can, they can um, and recovering from surgery, whatever it may be, um, someone else can, uh, can help be there to support you. So let's just start really basically, what is an advocate? So this is a supporter, believer, sponsor, promoter, campaign, backer, or spokesperson. So think of this person as your spokesperson. And an effective advocate is someone who has the following qualities. It's someone that you trust. Again, you may be putting your life in their hands if you're not gonna be able to speak. Second is you, um, that person needs to be willing to take action on your behalf. It can't be someone who just sits back and is gonna just let things go by the wayside. And third, they have to be someone who works well with others. I know that this isn't funny, but if, if you have a, um, a partner, someone in your family, and they don't work with, well with others, they have a short, with they you know maybe have a temper consider someone else if you're going in for a major um you know a major treatment maybe your neighbor or your best friend would be a better advocate than someone who is not going to work well with others who will challenge the staff um, and so for those reasons remember pick a really good advocate this is your spokesperson and someone who's going to kind of be taking all of the questions and all of the um, the feedback from your care team and making decisions, uh, perhaps on your behalf. All right, so we're moving into the third section of our agenda today, which is free resources. 
Um, so as far as the free resources go, we do have a, a mobile application called Patient Aider that the Patient Safety Movement Foundation um, developed with the help of a volunteer. Um, the volunteer was a nurse who um, got tired of people not understanding that there were some dangers and risks that they could help educate themselves about. Um, and so this app is designed in a way where you can pick topics by um, whether you're at home preparing to go into the hospital, whether you're in, in the hospital, or if you're at home recovering. And so that's the first screen on the left. Um, the middle screen is all the different topics that you can read about to prepare Again, um, if you're at home preparing, you know, hey, uh, I'm, I might need to know about anemia or, you know, hey, I'm going to, I probably will be on a ventilator. So, you know, do I need to read a little bit about that? Or, of course, you know, the hospital is the most common event. What do I need to know to make sure that I, um, I don't fall in the hospital? So this is a free mobile application that, again, we've developed. Um, I, uh, have, I have some directions here for how to download Patient Aider. Um, so feel free to visit this back later. Um, this uh, presentation will end up on YouTube, so you can always pause it and, and end up on the screen to figure out how to download it. So we have a ton of resources on the Patient Safety Movement Foundation website, and a lot of them are not resources that we've created. We're bringing you, you know, resources that we're aware of that may be helpful. So there's all sorts. I'm not going to go into each and every one, but, you know, from the Consumers Advancing Patient Safety, safety to Campaign Zero and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, and I think the My Health Notebook is from Johns Hopkins. We have a whole collection of pamphlets and booklets and guides um, to get you ready for um, you know, being in the hospital. And second, the kind of second category of resources that we have are checklists um, and kind of um, flyers that, that, that have information. So the one on the bottom right is from the Empowered Patient Coalition. And this just defines who people are um, if you're not in the hospital frequently, you don't work in healthcare, what's the difference between a charge nurse and a nurse manager? What's the difference between a resident and an intern? Sometimes it can get really confusing when there's just people coming in and out of your room all the time. So uh, really simple things like this that can help make your life um, or you know, your family member's life a little bit easier if they, if they aren't uh, in, in the healthcare space. So again, all of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation resources can be found on this website. And lastly, I'm just going to share a few resources. Again, don't have any official partnerships with these groups, but um, AHRQ, or the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, has an app called the Question Builder. So uh, this uh, app can be used for you to kind of put together that list of questions that you have for your doctor. Um, you know how it is. Sometimes you get into the doctor and you're like, oh, shoot, there were five things that I wanted to mention. I can only remember three. You know, now I'm going to have to come back in a month's time and, and bring up the other two questions that I have. So this is a great way um, of uh, putting together those questions and, and kind of holding them in the app. And second is uh, the World Health Organization's first consumer-based app. Um, and it's their WHO MedSafe app. And this will kind of guide you through those five key moments um, that we reviewed earlier for medication safety. And so this can be really helpful, again, if you're starting a medication and nervous about it, or, excuse me, adding new medications. All right, so COVID-19 resources. So I'm keeping it pretty brief on um, this presentation just because things are still changing. Uh, and this will go on to YouTube. I don't want any information to be out of date. Um, but please continue to follow your local distancing guidelines. We do have patient resources on our website that's compiled those. Um, and secondly, now that the vaccine is, uh, is available, um, we have compiled lots of information and questions about the COVID-19 vaccine um, at the link that you see on the screen. And one of the resources that we have um, on the COVID-19 page is about hospitalization during uh, a pandemic. As we know, um, visitation has been very limited. Uh, and so everything that I've talked about related to advocates may not be the case um, as it has been traditionally. You may not be able to be at the bedside. You may only be able to FaceTime in and be with your loved ones. And, and that is um, in some ways compromising patient safety because we don't have those traditional advocates by the bedside. Um, so uh, what's important to remember is um, you know, that, that you can be as involved as you can be, and um, we have some recommendations and, and ways that you can um, be involved during a pandemic uh, on our website. 
All right, so we're wrapping up here. So our ask of you today during Patient Safety Awareness Week is to advocate for yourself, speak up. You are an important part of, um, you know, a, a visit of a experience, uh, an interaction with a, um, a health worker. And I think sometimes people are afraid to speak up. They trust their doctor. They, they don't want to question it. But at the same time, if something is happening and you're not comfortable, um, it is your patient right to speak up and be able to um, be involved in your healthcare as a partner. Second is to advocate for your loved ones, again, as much as you can, especially during this pandemic. Third would be to use the resources that can help you, including the resources on our website, Patient Aider, um, those others that we've recommended. Fourth would be to share these resources with those who can benefit from them. If you know that your neighbor's husband is gonna go in for surgery next month, please feel free to share these resources with them. And last, give us your ideas for changes or new resources. Um, I'm hoping that perhaps during the Q&A here in a few minutes, you might have uh, some suggestions for what we might be able to add in the future. So with that said, um, the last thing that you can also help us do is reach more people. Um, during the pandemic here, uh, we haven't been able to go out traditionally and go to schools and nurses and organiz uh, nurses, sorry, schools and colleges um, or organizations um, in order to uh, do this presentation. We've had to do it all virtually. Um, so if you have any suggestions for where we can come and speak at a club or um, group that you're a part of, we would be more than happy to come out and give this presentation. So um, now I'm happy to open it up for Q&A, so I will pass it back to Sarah. Great, thank you so much, Ariana, and such interesting and informative information. So we really hope that you all utilize the free resources that we provide and take full advantage of some of the additional resources that Ariana highlighted. Um, I will give it about a minute or two to see um, if we can have some more people submit questions. I don't see any right now, but while we do wait, I did want to acknowledge a few people have asked if this webinar is being recorded. So the answer is yes. Um, this presentation is being recorded and we will upload the, the live um, webinar recording to YouTube and on our website. And we will also provide a PDF version of the slides if any of you would like to refer back and look at the resources that Ariana did um, so kindly link. Um, and we encourage you to take a look at those. So. I will give it just one or two more minutes to see if perhaps anyone has any questions for Ariana um, before we, we give you a couple more minutes back to your day. And I'll just okay. say, if you come across a resource, um, you know, you, as you're maybe seeking care or actually being provided care and you think, oh gosh, this would be a great resource for the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, please don't hesitate to email it to me. Or if it's three months from now and you can't find from my email, you know, just uh, we have a contact us page on our website. We'd love to continue to bolster all of the resources that we have on our website. I didn't even touch about um, the, the more formal uh, books that we have, but there are a ton of books that people who've experienced harm have had a lot of experience in the hospital um, have been able to share with us. So we, we do link to a lot of books that you can buy on Amazon and through your local bookstore. So um, I really appreciate everyone joining today and hope you have a great rest of your world, uh, not world, uh, Patient Safety Awareness Week.